All right. Okay. Wherever possible, let's kneel as we have our prayer to open. <coughs> Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We ask for your blessing, the blessing of your spirit to teach, instruct, and guide us as we open your word. Help us to be able to understand it in the way that you would have us to rightly understand it. May we see the significance of what we are talking about today and the relevance to each of our lives as we live right now especially as these things are under attack in the Christian world and even amongst us. Father, may we see the truth and see it clearly. May it touch our hearts, may it open our minds, and especially be with me also, that what is presented may glorify and honour you. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 We're going to continue on where we left off last week in Hebrews chapter 9 because it is a rather important subject. So at this point in time, the message is called the Mediator of the New Testament. The Mediator of the New Testament. So we'll be in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. We've already looked at chapter 8. The first few verses of chapter 8. We've looked at the first few verses of chapter 9. Gaining the understanding that there is a sanctuary in heaven. To understand the sanctuary in heaven, you must understand the sanctuary on earth. The earthly sanctuary is what teaches us, instructs us about what happens in heaven. And what Christ is doing in heaven, being our high priest. He hasn't just returned to heaven for the sake of sitting there to do nothing. He is there ministering on our behalf for the forgiveness of sins and all the other blessings. So just as there was a two-apartment sanctuary on earth, there must be a two-apartment sanctuary in heaven. And the word, as we looked at last week, bears this very fact so the prophecies that revolve around these things in the ministration of Christ are easily proven according to God's word. And the reality is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Though you may not be able to see it with the naked eye, you can see it through his word. And faith says, I take the word as it speaks. And that's what I will grasp onto. It doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what I hear. It doesn't matter what I feel. That makes no difference. What does the Word of God say to me? That's what we are to take. Because especially in the world that we're living in today, there are so many things that will deceive, whether it be by what you hear, by what you see, even of how you feel and the circumstances you're in. These things Satan will use to deceive you, to try and get you to lose your grip upon Christ. But the reality is we can't trust in these things. We must trust in what God's Word says. And that's what should settle it. So, as we look at Hebrews chapter 9, so let me turn there. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 11. We're going to once again continue to see throughout this entire passage, all the way through to the end of the chapter. There are very important points to be understood and learned. But also, once again, there is this emphasis, this emphasis of the old and the new. What was a type and what the anti-type is. What is a shadow compared to what the true and the genuine is. And what is a figure or a pattern compared to that which is not a figure. It is the real substance of things in heaven. This has continued to be compared throughout the entire chapter. Once again, solidifying our faith in the fact of that there is something real and tangible in heaven. It's not just phases of something taking place. It's not just one big open room. There is the reality of a sanctuary there with the ministration of Christ. 
and this chapter makes it very, very clear as we continue on. But if you notice verse 11, it says, But Christ being come, and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Once again, as I was mentioning, there is still a contrast in these verses of what has actually gone before, dealing with the earthly sanctuary, the ordinances, the priesthood, all the ceremonies, and it's being contrasted with the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. The contrast continues. Now, notice, one could not make the comer perfect, the other can make the comer perfect. And we will look at this as we go through. But notice, in verse 11, it says, But Christ being come, it gives the idea that there has been a period of waiting, of where Christ was waiting to become the high priest. That there was a time when he was not, but he was waiting for the time of when it was the right time for him to, to become the high priest. Now, as we look at the verses, we will see very clearly that this time was at the time of his crucifixion and his resurrection. And as we see here in verse 11 also, he is the high priest of good things to come. It's a better covenant. It has better promises. The good things to come actually uh, promise the forgiveness of sins, the blotting out of sins, sanctification of victory over sin, everlasting righteousness. These things are actually available in reality, not simply in a figure which was represented in the past, with the earthly sanctuary. Here, these are the better things, the good things to come. That which what the old was pointing to, the reality is actually here. And one of those things is a greater and more perfect tabernacle. It's the one that's not made with hands. It's not of this building. It's not the earthly sanctuary. We saw in chapter 8 and verse 2 that it is the heavenly sanctuary, the one that God built and not man. It's a better tabernacle. It is a greater tabernacle. Far exceeds that of which is upon earth. So once again, notice, it is still emphasizing the fact of you have the earthly, but no, this is even far better. It surpasses in all things the earthly sanctuary. We're talking about the one that God pitched and not man. This is the one that is actually in heaven. It's not the one that is on earth. It's greater. It is better. It far surpasses. But also, not only the sanctuary far surpasses that which is upon earth, but you also find in verse 12 that Christ doesn't enter into this sanctuary with the blood of bulls and goats or calves and goats like they did in the earthly. Christ actually enters this sanctuary with his own blood, which is far surpasses anything else that was offered here on earth. But it gives the understanding also that Christ's blood is of far, it is far superior than that of the blood of uh, calves and of goats. But also it shows that Christ, in the discharge of his office as high priest, it is, he has the preeminence over anything that any priest did upon this earth. He surpasses all. He is superior to all of what was taking place here on earth. So what Christ is doing in heaven is far superior. It is far surpasses anything that took place on this earth in the way of the sanctuary and the offerings. Because we're dealing with the true, the genuine, the real. We're not dealing with the figure as such. But notice it says that he enters by his own blood. And he enters only once into the holy place. Now the word, the Greek word there for holy place is in the plural. It should be holy places. It should be holy places. 
But notice, he enters once, once for all, which we will see as we come down through this chapter. But he only enters once. This is in contrast to the Levitical priesthood. Okay? You have one offering, which is Christ. He makes one offering once for all, whereas the Levitical priesthood, there were continual offerings. Christ only has to enter into the heavenly sanctuary once. The priest had to enter continually, day after day after day after day, with the holy place. And once a year, but year after year after year after year, with the most holy place. They were continually going in and out, continually going in and out, continually sacrificing. But with Christ, this is not so. He only has to sacrifice once. He only has to enter once. He doesn't have to keep on going backwards and forwards, showing that his sacrifice, but also showing this entire system, far supersedes anything that was upon the earth. This is actually efficacious. It is effective. The earthly was not. It was simply a figure. So what Christ is doing is far superior. And this is, you're going to have this emphasized through this chapter. A far better sacrifice. So firstly, his sacrifice and his blood is far better than that of the young bulls and and goats. Secondly, he only he enters once into the holy places in the heavenly sanctuary itself, and these are far better than that which was upon earth. Everything is far better, it is more superior, but gives the understanding that it is real, it is tangible in heaven. But notice when he entered in the bottom of verse 12, it says, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Okay, as you go through the book of Hebrews, you find, if you're writing down the references, chapter 5 and verse 9, you have in this system eternal salvation. So in chapter 5 verse 9, it mentions eternal salvation. In chapter 6 and verse 2, there's the issue of eternal judgment. In this verse that we're reading here in chapter 9 and verse 12, you have the issue of eternal redemption. But then you find also in verse 14, it is the eternal spirit. And in verse 15, it's the eternal inheritance. Notice when you start speaking about the heavenly things, it is directly linked to that which is eternal. But when you start speaking about the earthly things, they were only temporal. Notice, once again, emphasizing this contrast between the earthly and the heavenly. The heavenly is actually there. It is real. It is far better than that which was upon the earth. The earth could only offer something that was temporal, where the heavenly offers that which is eternal. It stands the test of time for eternity. Everything of earth under the old covenant was only of a temporal nature. There was only provisional and temporal forgiveness and atonement, where with Christ it is the genuine, it is real, and it is for eternity. Now, notice verses 13 and 14. Now, this is important because of what is going to be spoken about by the time we get down to verse 15. <coughs> When we look at verse 13 and 14, notice it says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, it sounds like a mouthful, but we'll look at it, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Notice, once again, you have a contrast. It is comparing the earthly with the heavenly. Notice, it says, For if the blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean. Okay, the ashes of the heifer. The heifer was the offering of a red heifer, which dealt with the purifying or the separation of sin in every facet of your life. 
when they sprinkled the ashes with water and hyssop and so forth. It was a purification process. It was a purifying, but also it was there for a ceremony of separation of sin and that which was unclean in the life. The blood of the bulls and of the goats was there for the purpose of the forgiveness of sins and making an atonement for sin on your behalf. But notice in the bottom of verse 13, it says, sanctifieth to the purifying of what? The that's only something that's outward. <clears throat> sanctifieth for the purifying of the flesh. That's all it did. It was just a ceremonial outward cleansing. It didn't deal with the matters of the heart. It didn't deal with the matters of the deep recesses of the mind, as you find in verse 14, where one purges the conscience this only purges the outside. It was just sim simply a ceremonial outward cleansing. That's the best that this system could offer. It did nothing to actually reach within the conscience to take away that guilt and the sin that was there to purge it, to cleanse it, and make it actually clean. It was simply outward. That's all it was. That's all it could accomplish. It could not do any more than this. It couldn't make them perfect. Notice, if you go to chapter 7, and notice verse 11, we find this very fact emphasized here when the comparison is made of the Levitical priesthood, which is being superseded by the Melchizedekian priesthood, which is Christ. If you look at verse 11, it says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Notice verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect, as in the law, the Levitical priesthood governing the, the law, governing the Levitical priesthood. It made nothing perfect, perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope by the which we draw nigh unto God. And if you look at chapter 10 and verse... One, it says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. This is dealing with the, the law, Mo, law of Moses, the ceremonial law. And not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices, which they offer year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. The system on earth offered no perfection whatsoever. It couldn't give it to you. It was simply something that was external. It was not dealing with the matters of the heart. It couldn't. Verse 4 tells you in chapter 10 that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins. It was impossible for it because they were only figures. They were only patterns. They were only there to teach you, to instruct you in what the rule actually was and when it was coming. Which is the high priestly ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. The real sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ, which can purge the life from sin. Literally, not figuratively and only outwardly. See, when you start tampering with this whole issue of the heavenly sanctuary and Christ's high priestly ministry, you start tampering with your own salvation. This is the implication and this is how important it actually is that we don't tamper with the heavenly sanctuary or the high priestly ministry of Christ. Because if one wants to do so, it puts their salvation on shaky ground. Because you're starting to cut away the very work that Christ is doing there in that literal sanctuary to actually save you from sin. You're cutting out the work of salvation, of which the earthly sanctuary under the old covenant prefigured. This is the importance of this subject. Yet you have the Christian world at large wants nothing to do with it. And boohoo's it. And then you have those within the Adventist church saying, oh, no, 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 there's not a literal sanctuary up in there. Oh, it's just phases of ministry. Oh, no, how could Christ be doing something like that? No, no, it was all finished at the cross. But notice verse 14 of chapter 9. So verse 13, it was impossible. It was only external. It was only outward in the flesh. It was just a ceremonial cleansing. It couldn't actually bring a true deep cleansing. But notice how it starts out in verse 14. 
How much more? How much more? How much better? How much more or far superior is that of the blood of Christ? This is the emphasis. Christ is being exalted above everything else. How much more? How much better? How, far, how much more far superior is the blood of Christ than that of what was taking place in the earthly sanctuary? It's real. He surpasses all others. The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ in contrast to the blood of the animals. The blood of Christ is far more effective or efficacious than that of the animals. The blood of animals could only cleanse ceremonially, outwardly. The blood of Christ can actually cleanse inwardly the conscience from dead works. But notice there in verse 14 he says, Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. I want you to notice that. He offered himself without spot to God. What does this mean? Let's go back. Firstly, and notice it says he offered himself. Firstly, it tells you it was voluntary. It was not forced. Christ was not forced to give up his life as a sacrifice for sin in order to save us. Christ voluntarily laid down his life. You find that emphasized in John chapter 10, verse 18. It says that He lays down His life for His sheep. He gives His life for His sheep. Christ is the one who voluntarily gave His life an offering for sin. But what does it mean without spot? Well, without spot brings about the quality of the sacrifice. In Leviticus chapter 13, you have the whole issue of how to diagnose leprosy. And it was diagnosed according to the spot and what the color of the spot was like. But notice the spot on the outside, as you read through the chapter, the spot on the outside was nothing more than a breaking out of the corruption that was already on the inside. The disease was already on the inside and the spot on the outside was simply just a manifestation of the disease that was already present in the life. So this offered himself without spot gives the understanding that Christ was morally pure inwardly and it was represented as such outwardly in his life. The quality of of the sacrifice. He was perfect. That's why each sacrifice that was brought to the temple was inspected by the priest in order to determine whether or not it was a fit sacrifice. It was to be without spot or blemish. It was to be pure. It was to be without defect. It was not to be sick or diseased in any way. Why? Because it represented Jesus Christ. He was morally pure inwardly and outwardly. He was a perfect sacrifice. He was a perfect sacrifice, free from all moral defilement. 9 and verse 14. He offered himself without spot to God. Notice it goes on to purge. Purge is to cleanse. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Purge is to cleanse, to clean, to purify. Once again, emphasizing the fact that it's in contrast to the sanctifying or the purifying of the flesh, that which was simply external. The blood of Christ actually reaches in and cleanses internally through to the external, the dead works. The blood of Christ will actually cleanse inwardly to the point of where it will cleanse outwardly the dead works. It will purge them. It will cleanse them. But it starts from within. From the conscience. 
It's cleansed from dead works in order for you to be able to serve the living God. You can't serve the God in the flesh. See, self needs to die. Those dead works, that old way of life, the old man, the body of sin, needs to be put to death by the blood of Christ in order for you to walk in newness of life. It has to be done. And that cannot be done without the ministration of Christ as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. All these things you're cutting off if you want to get rid of the sanctuary in heaven and this high priestly work of Christ and ministering as our high priest in heaven. All of this is gone. It is impossible for something like that to take place unless you have someone ministering on your behalf. You can't have your conscience cleansed. You can't have the dead works cleansed, put to death. So you can serve God. It's not possible because there's no one there ministering on your behalf to bring this about. It can't be finished at the cross. There must be administration of the blood and the earthly sanctuary proves this very fact. But friends, your conscience isn't cleansed or purged by the blood of Christ in order for you to, or to enable you to go out and live another round of filthiness and sin. That's not the purpose of the blood and the cleansing. It's there so you can serve God, the living God. And I find that interesting how it says there, to serve the living God. The living God is the creator God. When you look at this at the end of time, When you've got this whole issue of worship that is being forced at the end of time, where you're being forced not to worship the living God, but you're being forced to worship the God of this world, who is not the creator, who is not the life giver. You're worshiping, you're worshiping which ultimately states then, you are worshiping a system of death. That's all you're doing. And it will end in eternal death. But guess what? In Revelation 13, God's people who will worship the living God, that system ends in eternal life, even though they are under the threat of death, death. death. by man. See, they've got a high priest. They've got a high priest that they're clinging on to. Ah, oh, but guess what? So of those that worship the beast and his image, the papal power and the replication of that by prostate, apostate Protestantism, they're also worshipping a high priest. Yeah. Well, doing well. The Pope. Yes. And ultimately, Satan himself. That's mm -hmm. why it's a part of the three angels' messages. This is why it is a part of the three angels' messages. We need to be preaching it and exposing it and making it more plain and more plain as we get close, closer to the end of time. Now, let's see the great importance of why Paul is saying what he is saying. In Hebrews chapter 9 and notice verses 15 to 17. Because notice how he starts verse 15. He says, and for this cause. So he's referring back to what he's already said. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, that seems like a big mouthful, doesn't it? Let's make it plain. And for this cause, based upon the previous verses, he lived a pure life. We saw that. He made the sacrifice, the sacrifice of himself. It is his blood, which is more effective than the blood of bulls and goats. He can cleanse the conscience from dead works. Therefore, based upon this, 
the whole issue of his life, his death, which also incorporates his resurrection, his, the whole issue of his sacrifice, his blood, what he can do in being a high priest because of this cause. He is, notice, he is the mediator of the New Testament or covenant. Covenant is a better word. It's based upon this fact that he is the mediator of the New Covenant. Therefore, Unless someone qualifies with exactly the same as Christ, that perfect life, therefore perfect sacrifice. It was him as the sacrifice. It was his blood, which is far better than the blood of bull and goat, bulls and goats. It is based upon the fact that his blood can actually cleanse the conscience. It can purge the conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That is the qualification of being the mediator of the new covenant. That is why the system of the priesthood on earth is nothing more than an apostate system to sub, to uh, sub, to what's the word I'm after to supersede or to obscure the ministration of Jesus Christ in heaven. <clears throat> That's all it is. That's all it is. It is a false system when it comes to being the mediator of the new covenant. But notice, there I've preached a sermon before. I can't remember how long ago it is. But there is a reason why Jesus is Savior. And the reason why Jesus is Savior is because he is Redeemer. It's the only reason why he's Savior. It's the only one that has actually paid the price to buy you back, to redeem you from sin, can be your Savior. No one else can. See, because Christ actually paid the price with the shedding of his blood, he gave his life for you, he's actually purchased you, and therefore he is the only one that can actually save you. That's why the Bible says there is salvation in none other name among men, or given among men, whereby we must be saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. Christ is the only Savior no system on earth can save you. No priesthood on earth can save you. No pope can save you. None can save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you because only Jesus Christ has actually paid the ransom price. Because The reason why he is Savior is because he is Redeemer. Exactly the same with what you're working with here. The only reason why Christ is the mediator of the new covenant is because of the, qualifi the qualifying that he has gone through in order to make him that. <clears throat> the whole incarnation, his pure life, his pure sacrifice, his pure blood. Therefore, he can purge the conscience. He can purge inwardly, not just outwardly. It qualifies him. No one else is the mediator of the new covenant. This whole issue of the mediation of Mary, the whole issue of this mediation of the priesthood and of the Pope and all that sort of stuff is nothing more than a slap in the face of God with this system. It is in defiance and direct rebellion against him. This is why God says Babylon is fallen. It is fallen. You can't look to that system. That system is a great apostate system where Satan tries to wipe out and supplant everything that deals with pointing you towards what Christ is doing right now. This is what made Desmond Ford so dangerous. The book of Hebrews is so clear with what the reality actually is. But the devil used him to try to break down the foundation and the pillar and the foundation of our faith, the sanctuary message. Friends, and it's interesting, the comments are saying, I'm starting to digress here. But we'll bring it back. It's interesting that you have the whole issue of one of the excuses of why Alan White was only good for devotional material is that you couldn't rely upon her in theological matters because she was not a theologian. But guess what? None of the prophets were either. So how can you put your faith in God's word? None of the apostles were theologians. The theologians of the day were re rejected Jesus Christ himself. John the Baptist was not a theologian. None of them were theologians. They didn't go to the schools of the day. 
the implication or the far-reaching implications of that statement, you must throw out the entire Word of God. Amen. Let's move on. He's the mediator of the new covenants. But notice it says, he's mediator of the new covenant or the new testament. And that is by means of death, death his death on the cross. The hope of redemption, the hope of forgiveness, the hope of the internal inheritance under the old covenant actually hinged upon Christ shedding his blood on the cross. It all hinged upon what Christ was coming to do. It all pointed toward the new covenant. It was to instruct. It was to teach them about it. Because notice it says, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament or the first covenant, it all hinged on the death of Jesus Christ. But the Jews turned the system itself into salvation itself by actually going through all of these ceremonies and actually going through and performing these things. We have righteousness. We have forgiveness. We are standing right with God now because we performed thus and so. But all this was doing was a provisional exercise teaching them of what the reality was to come, the death of Jesus Christ. There was only forgiveness through him. It was a school. It was there to teach and instruct them of the ways of salvation through the Messiah who would shed his blood for the forgiveness of these things, for redemption. But notice it goes on in the bottom of verse 15. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Oh, people love to twist this one. Well, we've all been called, haven't we? There you go, we should all receive the internal inheritance. Go to chapter 11. Notice what God's word, same writer, same book, speaking about the same thing. Hebrews chapter 11, notice verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was what? Was he promised an inheritance to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance? Did what? Oh, everyone's called, but not, not everyone steps out in faith. Not everyone obeys the call. You can't separate obedience from the call. The eternal inheritance is only secured through an obedient life. That doesn't mean, I, now, let me qualify this. I am not saying that your obedient life merits you or God owes you this internal, eternal inheritance. I'm not saying that at all. Your obedience doesn't merit you anything. Your obedience is simply a revealing of a surrendered, a continually surrendered life to Jesus Christ. Keeping the commandments is not going to get you to heaven, but you're not <coughs> going to get there without it. A surrendered life bears the fruit of obedience. A life that is in rebellion against God shows very clearly that there is a condition of the heart that is separating you from God and therefore there is no salvation. They go hand in hand. Obedience doesn't merit your salvation, but it's certainly the fruits of, the re of being a recipient of the saving grace of God. There is obedience. No one is benefited by the calling unless they actually heed it and obey. And notice, if you go to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Notice verse 18. Acts 26 and verse 18. Acts 26 and verse 18. Acts 26. Yeah. The pages are not turning. You're right. Acts 26, verse 18. It says, 
to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them. Who are they that are going to have this inheritance? By, by, by faith that is in me. No sanctification, which is an obedient life. No inheritance. Simple as that. This is not unusual because if you actually go back to the book of Deuteronomy, notice Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, starting in verse 8. Notice. And I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. I have 24 verses to show that this is not a one-off thing. Plus, there's more. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 11, notice in verse 8. It says, Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may, notice, that ye may be strong, and go in and possess the land, whether ye go to possess it, and that ye may prolong your days in the land, which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed, a land that flows with milk and honey. Notice their obedience is directly connected to the possessing of the land. Notice chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. Chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. When thou shalt beget children, and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and ye shall, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that ye shall soon utterly perish from what? Whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. This is the reverse of what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. Mm -hmm. Obedience goes hand in hand with the possessing of the land. Disobedience goes hand in hand with being dispossessed of the land, which was the inheritance. Nothing has changed. You see exactly the same thing in the book of Hebrews. Obedience goes hand in hand with possessing the heavenly Canaan, the, in, the eternal inheritance. Disobedience will bring about the dispossessing of that land. You will not possess it in any way whatsoever. You will be utterly cast out. One must experience righteousness by faith. It's the only way you can have, it. You can have obedience. In order to possess the eternal inheritance. But I've preached on that in years past, so we won't go into that. But let's go back to Hebrews chapter 9. And let's start to look more fully at this issue of a, a testament and testator. What is he talking about? So, a part of this testament, or this will is another name, covenant, is an eternal inheritance. But also you see in verse 16, it says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. There must be the death of the one who makes or leaves the will. But why is this so? <clears throat> because a testament or a will is not in force until the person dies. You can't go up and, and uh, um, get there and deal out to every party that is in the will, everything that's in the will, when the person is still alive. That will has not gone into effect. That will only goes into effect when the person has died. But guess what? We want to go against what God says. And we'll see this in a moment. Okay, we'll see this in a moment. The will or the covenant 
or the testament is only in force when there is the death of the one who actually makes it or leaves it or gives it. When it's his. When he dies, it is in force. Which you find in verse 17. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. But notice. Can you add anything to that will after the person's died? No. Can you take anything away from it? No. Can you change it in any way? No. Oh, but we love to go to the courts of law and contest it. The reason why I raise that is because Christianity today does exactly the same thing with this very thing. No, 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 it's Sunday. No, 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 it's all finished at the cross. If it's going to form a part of the will, it must be added by the testator before he dies. Because when he dies, the blood ratifies it. And it is, that is it, it is finished. You cannot add to, you cannot take away from. So this whole <coughs> issue of Sunday sacredness is an absolute flop based upon Hebrews chapter 9. Christianity goes, no, 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 we're going to keep it in honor of his resurrection. Oh, you can worship any day, it's okay. Yeah, but that's where did Christ instruct us that that was to be the case when he was living? Because it's his covenant and it's not open for us to contest it. He made it, he arranged it, he brings it to man and says, here it is, are you going to agree to it? And unfortunately today, Christianity at large says, no, I'm not. I want this change and that change and we're going to put a clause in here and you're just going to have to put up with it. We don't care what you said. But you can't do that according to God's word. You can't do that. You're adding to. You're taking away from. You can't do that. God's word tells you this. And the book of Hebrews was written somewhere, I think it was around 62, 63 AD. This is a long time after the death of Christ. And he's contending with the Jews. You can't change anything. You can't change anything. This is why it's known as the new covenant, even though it is the everlasting covenant. Because they had to wait for it to be ratified by the blood of Christ. That's the only reason why it's the new covenant. Because they had to wait for the actual literal death of the testator. Implying then that he, Christ was not ministering literally as the high priest prior to this time of his death. Why? He had nothing to offer. It wasn't ratified. It was simply everything was based upon that which Christ was coming to do. And everything pointed towards what Christ was coming to do and going to do in heaven. Verse 18. It says, Whereupon neither the first testament or covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no, no remission. What Paul is doing here is going through and proving his point. And he's going to make an application of it when you come to verse 23. But Paul is going through to prove his point point of this whole issue of that a covenant is in effect when it is ratified by the blood <clears throat> see even the old covenant the blood of calves was provided or the death of animals was provided and it was mingled with water 
and then with scarlet wool and hyssop, it was sprinkled upon the people. They were a part of the ones that were making the covenant. All that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. That's what they said. They made, they entered into the covenant. But then you had the book of the law. But then a part of that was also the sanctuary with all its furniture. So everything, the people, the book and the sanctuary with all its furniture, it was all ratified by the blood, by the animals. But it also clearly shows that the tabernacle and its services were also a part of the old covenant because it was sprinkled at the same time. The use of hyssop, scarlet, also can indicate the issue of cleansing or purifying from sin, a complete consecration to God. Remember, after with David's repentance after the sin of Bathsheba in Psalm 51, he says... Um, Wash me with hyssop. Hyssop was used as indicating a purging, a cleansing, a separating from sin. Therefore, a dedication or a consecration to God. So, symbolically, the people were consecrated to this covenant, to God. The sanctuary with all its furniture was consecrated and dedicated to God. The whole thing was ratified by blood. So a sacrificial death must take place in order to establish the first covenant. But this gives the understanding of the true, the real in heaven. The new likewise, or the new covenant, also must be confirmed or established by the sacrificial death of Christ. Oh, the implications of this are incredible. And we'll look at them, look at that in a moment. But it says in almost all things, in verse 22, almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Why does it say only almost all things? It's because under the old Levitical system, if you were too poor to bring a blood sacrifice, you could bring a, a fifth part of an ephah of fine flour. Leviticus 5.1, I think it is, or 5.10 or something like that. Okay, which still was a representation of the broken or crushed body of Christ. But that was not blood. But as a general rule, it was blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no purging. There's no cleansing. Because it is the blood that makes an atonement. Leviticus 17.17. 17. But notice the application. Notice Paul is going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. The old and the new, the old and the new, the old and the new. That which was upon earth to that which is in heaven. That which is upon earth to that which is in heaven. He's going backwards and forwards down through the entire chapter of this very thing. And he continues that on into the verses in chapter 10. This would be, just to emphasize it, all of this time that he is spending in doing this, all of this would be absolutely meaningless if there's no sanctuary in heaven and no ministration of Christ as high priest in heaven, it would be meaningless. He's wasting his time. You might as well just rip it out of the Bible because it doesn't need to be there. It doesn't profit us in any way whatsoever. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It's for our learning, for our teaching. But it's also there for instruction in righteousness, to show us the paths of truth and righteousness in the way which we need to go. It's there for us, for our learning. That's why it's there. It's not there to be ripped out. Although many have tried, and the Christian world at large tries now. But this is our message. Notice verse 23. It was, notice, it was therefore, which is making a conclusion based upon what he has just said. Necessary. That word necessary is needful. It was therefore necessary that the, notice that the patterns, 
that the patterns of these of things in the heavens should be purified with these. Those patterns are the earthly things. It was necessary that they needed to be purified with these things. The patterns of that which is actually in heaven. He's making the comparison now of what he has just said. Should be purified with these. Notice he goes on and says, but, in contrast to this, but, the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Guess what? The heavenly sanctuary needed to be dedicated and consecrated to the service and work of God ever before Christ started his ministration, just as it was in the earthly. He couldn't start straight away. There needed to be a dedication service to anoint the heavenly sanctuary. This was prophesied of in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, to anoint the most holy. That was to take place when Christ ascended back to heaven in AD 31, to anoint the heavenly sanctuary in order for it to be consecrated to the work and service of God ever before he could start his ministration as high priest. And it had to be done with better sacrifices than these. Why? It was the blood of Jesus Christ himself. That ratified this covenant, covenant and dedicated, sprinkled the heavenly sanctuary and all its furniture. It shows that there has to be a sanctuary in heaven just as there was on earth. It has to be the same. Or all of this is just lies. That's all it is. <clears throat> Notice better sacrifices than these, better sacrifices than goats and calves, which we've, he's already taken the time to show us what that is. It's the sacrifice of himself, his blood. And it's even better than that. Because, notice, if you look at verse 24, it says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Not the earthly sanctuary. Okay, he's not going to dedicate that. He's not going to minister there. Not that place. We've already looked at that in chapter 8. Which are the figures of the true. Once again, figures of the true. That word true is very interesting. That word true means the genuine. It means the real. The actual one. So the sanctuary on earth, its two compartments, so forth, is actually a representation, it is an imitation of the genuine, the actual real one that is in heaven. If the heavenly sanctuary is not the same, well then the earthly sanctuary is simply just fraudulent and a lie. That's all it is. Because it's not a figure of the, of the genuine. Notice, he has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Entered into heaven itself. And I have one commentary that goes through the book of Hebrews and goes through the sanctuary, all this sort of stuff, and then comes to verse 24 in chapter 9, and he completely and utterly denies all the evidence that is there in the previous chapters and goes, ah, oh, there you go, heaven itself is the sanctuary. But we don't worry about Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. That he ascends to heaven. Sits at the right hand of the, on the majesty of high, the throne of God, in the capacity of high priest. And he ministers in the true tabernacle. The one which the Lord pitched and not man. Not heaven. The tabernacle that is in heaven. Allow scripture to explain scripture. He has gone into heaven itself. Amen. The heavenly sanctuary that's in heaven. But notice it says, now to appear in the presence of God for us. I like this. This is good. It should do our hearts good to look at this. The best that the earthly priests could do was stand before the veil, which was before the Lord, whose presence was literally there in between the cherubim above the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. The best they could do was stand before the veil. And then the best that the high priest alone could do was actually enter in behind the veil. But that wasn't without the incense. And the smoke of the incense filled that area. There had to be some type of obscuring of the glory of God. And even with that obscuring, 
Aaron had to make an atonement for himself and his household so that he was pure and holy in the eyes of God ever before he could step in or else he would be struck dead instantly. Why is it going to be any different for us? When it comes to glorification, when we come to meet our maker face to face, why do we think that we're going to have sin present in our lives and Christ is going to snap his fingers, wave his magic wand and no, you're all going to be holy and clean. Why do you think it says the wicked run and they scream out to the mountains and rocks to hide them from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who's going to be able to stand? Well, only those that have made, that have cooperated with their high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. They're the only ones that are going to stand at that time. You're not going to stand if you have sin. At some stage, his intercession ceases. What are you going to do if there's still sin in your life then? When he comes back, he's not coming to rectify that. The end of chapter 9 tells us that. We'll look at that in a moment. But notice, it says, that's the best that the earthly priest could do. That's the best that they could do. But notice, it says here that Christ has gone and he's in heaven and he's there to appear before God. For us. Now, in the presence of God, that word presence means countenance, face, and person. Countenance, face, person. You know what that means? That means that Christ is standing face to face before the Father. There is nothing in between. There's nothing in between. He stands literally in the presence of God continually because he doesn't need to go out and in, out and in, out and in, like all those priests. He doesn't have to go out and in, out and in. And he's going to emphasize this. doesn't have to. He continually stands in the very presence of God face to face, representing us before him. Why on earth would you want to look to a man? Amen. Except for the man Christ Jesus. Amen. No one here can get that close. They'd be struck dead instantly. Even with Moses, when he was living without sin at the time of Sinai, living completely without sin, he says, I want to see your glory. And God says, that's okay. I'll make all my goodness pass before thee and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. But guess what, Moses? I'm going to have to hide you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to have to put my hand there and you might just be able to see some of my hinder parts. And even then he was that fearful that it created a response of where he fell down on his face and he worshipped God. Yet... We have Jesus Christ who stands face to face with the Father, whose law we have broken, pleading our forgiveness, pleading his blood. Oh, but no, it was all finished at the cross. How can you have that concept studying the book of Hebrews? You can't. He has no reason to appear before the Father. It's like, except to say, Father, I finished it down there. But what's he been waiting for the last 2,000 years for? Mm. If it's all finished, why doesn't he finish it? Mm. Why prolong it and continue to have all this suffering when he could have finished it after the cross? Why? Why? So he stands there in the very presence of God for us. He continually is there. Notice verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself, what? Often. There you go. As the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. He doesn't need to offer himself. Friends, there's no repeats. That's what I've labeled this section. There's no repeats. There doesn't need to be a repeat. Unlike the Catholic Church says, no, 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 we need, to, we need to crucify him and sacrifice him again every time we do Mass. What a mockery that is. <clears throat> there are no repeats. 
What they're saying is that his, his sacrifice is not effective. No, we just need to add to it. It was insufficient. We need to bring it up to the mark every time. But we need to continually bring it up to the mark. That's how inefficient his sacrifice was. But there's no repeats like the blood of the bulls and calves, goats and all those sorts of things, the lambs. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is far superior. It is a better sacrifice. It doesn't need to be repeated continually. And the contrast is given where they go into the, the sanctuary every year with the blood of others. Every year, every day, they had to continually go in and out, showing that there were actually many sacrifices and that the earthly sanctuary actually couldn't deal with the sin problem. Mm -hmm. But it's not so with Christ. His sacrifice is durable. It's effective once and for all times. It doesn't need to go backwards and forwards from heaven, offering himself often. He enters in once with, the, with his own blood in his person into the heavenly sanctuary. And he stands face to face with God. And that is perfect. That is perfect. Notice he continues on in verse 26. And he gives the conclusion of what he said in verse 25. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. If it's not sufficient enough, he needs to be sacrificed and sacrificed and sacrificed and sacrificed and sacrificed. And therefore the Catholics in one very small sense would be correct. That system, not Catholics themselves, the system. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Notice he gives the contrast though. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Notice the end of the world is in the context of the sacrifice of himself. So the end of the world in that passage is a direct reference to the crucifixion of Christ. That's when he dealt with the sin problem. That's when he made the sacrifice for sin was at that time John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world the instruction was given that his name was to be called Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. This is the whole issue of the sacrifice of himself. But this verse does not imply that sin was put away at the cross once and for all. Many would like to think that. But you can't even make the verse say that. Because the whole issue of what we have looked at and what is already been there in the verses prior, it shows that Christ must minister his blood in the heavenly sanctuary, face to face with God. For the ultimate end of sin, which is the blotting out of sin. Plus, verse 27 continues to emphasize this he said and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment and verse 28 says so christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin under salvation i want you to notice in verse 27 it says and as and then in verse 28 so christ a comparison is being made here as it is appointed unto men once to die. It's only, only been God's intention since the ent entrance of sin that man would only die once. So it is with Christ. It is only ordained of God for Christ to die only and then the judgment. It doesn't mean that you die and automatically you have judgment. The Bible teaches very clearly that that judgment is at a future stage. But you die once, you're going to face the judgment. It's as simple as that. You cannot get out of it. And exactly the same with Christ. 
is ordained that he should only die once and then the judgment. He will perform the work of judgment. He will perform the work of the blotting out of sin. He will finish up his high priestly ministry. And guess what? As it says in verse 28 there, it says that um, Christ once offered bear the sins of many, which he did on the cross. And unto them that look for him shall he appear. What time? Second Without what? Sin. Sin. Keeping in its context, he's not coming to be your sin bearer. Mm-hmm. He's coming to bring the finality of salvation. If he's not coming to be a sin bearer, he's not coming as a high priest. <coughs> so therefore, there is no magic wand that he's going to wave and get rid of the last vestiges of sin in your life. If it's not done prior, it's not done at all. It's left undone. Christ is only coming back as a king to claim his own. He's not coming back as a high priest. He's not coming back to minister salvation to you. He's coming back to claim out of the clutches of God's enemies and the enemies of his people to conquer them and take them home. Salvation from the very presence of sin. He's already finished his ministration by this time. It's done. He's already been the sin bearer. He's already been the high priest. It's all over. It's finished. It's finished. The importance of the subject of the sanctuary as it is brought out in the book of Hebrews is absolute paramount for us to understand. We can't just give it a skirting over. We can't just get there and go, oh, well, we need to understand these things. Because this is under attack. The whole ministration of Christ is under attack. But it's all going to end. Which you see from the book of Daniel. It will all end. It says how long? The question is asked. How long is it going to be that the sanctuary and the host are going to be trodden underfoot? How long is the ministration of Christ going to be obscured? How long is it going to be superseded by earthly means? How long are they going to trample upon his ministration and upon his people? And the answer comes in verse 14. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel was told, Daniel, don't worry about it. It's all going to be worked out in the judgments. And those who want to trample upon this, they themselves will be given to the burning flames. The judgments. And the only way you understand the judgment that is to take place in heaven is to look at the pattern. To get there and just cast it off because I can't see it. As I said, that's poor hermeneutics. But also that is sloppy and poor Christianity. You won't even take God at his word or take the time to search it from cover to cover to figure out what does God's word actually say about judgment. When it is so clear. If one wants to reject that, that's okay. You can trample on the sanctuary of God, figuratively here on earth, by promulgating all these false ideas and all these false doctrines about this whole sanctuary question. But you must also understand that even you as well will be worked out in the judgments. You yourself will also be weighed in the balances and you are going to be found wanting. The whole book of Daniel is about judgment. Daniel means God is my judge. And it's not only judgment on earthly kingdoms, but you have judgment in heaven. Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9. The whole book is about judgment. Not only judgment on earth, but judgment in heaven, which affects earth. So it is time, as Seventh-day Adventists, that we hold fast to the truth that is actually being given to us, the light that actually is in God's Word,
that is actually there instead of skirting around it and not even looking at it, not even studying it, so that when we are actually confronted with it, we can't even give an answer for the faith that we profess to hold and believe in. We know nothing about it. Because it comes to that point where it's like, yeah, but how am I going to be looked upon? I'm going to be frowned upon. I'm even going to be frowned upon amongst my own people. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth. How can I say something like that, like that to someone else? It needs to be said. The truths need to be made plainer and plainer and plainer as we get closer and closer and closer to the end of time. We are instructed, as John the Baptist gave a very, very straight testimony, we are told that the people of God at the last days are to give a straighter testimony than John the Baptist. And yet he called the religious leaders of the day a bunch of vipers, malicious people, that, malicious leaders that were carving up the people. Essentially, that's what it is. A viper, when you go back and you start looking at that word, it is one that is malicious. Imagine if you said that today. <laughs> but these are the realities. It's beautiful truth. It gives us reassurance. We have Christ himself the one who was god that became man is standing face to face with the father as our advocate as long as we are living a life of faith we have no fear of judgment why because the judgment will vindicate us in the eyes of the entire universe well, let's pray Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the depth that is there. We haven't even, we haven't even really scraped halfway of what is actually there. Father, it goes beyond my understanding. The depth of the knowledge that you have, that you've revealed in your word. And we thank you, Lord. The detail that is given, the intricate work, the way that Paul has written under the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, testifies to the fact of the stamp that you have placed on your word. The arguments that are there, the force of the truth that is there, that is so compelling to understand what actually literally is in heaven. Father, we cannot mistake it. It is a part of the first angel's message. Let us understand it. May we hold fast to it, for it is under attack, even amongst us. Lord, may it bring great reassurance to our hearts. May it bring joy to our hearts. May we see the depth of the wisdom and the knowledge of God in the way that the interest and the detail that he has put in place, that none should be lost. The information is there. We know what Christ is doing. Father, help us not to be stubborn of heart, to actually surrender and cooperate. But may we grasp with full faith our High Priest, Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat>